Hello and welcome to session one. Today I'll be introducing you to the world of butterflies and moths, including why they are important and what you can do to help. So grab a broom, put your feet up and enjoy. So what are butterflies and moths? They are thick legs, which make them an insect. But they also have teeth. Four wings made up of thousands of tiny scales, overlapping like tiles on a roof, which puts them in the order called Lepidoptera. Lepidoptera meaning scaly winged. In Britain, there are 59 species of butterflies and 2,500 species of moth. As there are so many species of moth, experts split them into two groups, the larger, the macromoths, and the smaller, micromoths. There's around 900 macromoths in Britain. So what's the difference between butterflies and moths? This is a question I'm asked a lot. <laughs> um, people may think there are simple rules for telling moths from butterflies, but none of these rules hold completely true. And most of the differences are myths. It's not about colour, hairiness or time of day. Just like butterflies, moths vary greatly in appearance as well as size. The shapes are characteristic of different moth families and can help when identifying them. Colours and patterns also vary. Some really bright and bold like this small elephant hawk moth, while others have wonderful camouflage. You can also see moths at any time of the year with different species active in different months, including midwinter. However, one rule that can be a useful guide, particularly in the UK, is that butterflies have club-shaped antennae. While most moths have feathery or tapering ones. Moths have feathery antennae um, because they use them to smell. The reason why males have larger, more feathery antennae is because females create a special smell called a pheromone to attract a mate. So a male finds a female by smelling their hormones. So let's have a go at testing this rule. Butterfly or moth? Correct, so this is the green veined white butterfly. Butterfly or moth? Well done, this is the vapor moth. Butterfly or moth? Yeah, this is the beautiful pale tussock moth. So how about this one? Butterfly or moth? If he said butterfly, well done, this is the ginger skipper. So what about this one? Butterfly or moth? Yeah, I threw that one in as a little bit of a trick. So despite no UK butterflies having feathery antennae, some butterflies and moths do have similar shaped antennae. So the ginger skipper and the six spot burnet both have very, very similar antennae. So while this rule is useful as a guide, do be aware that they are exceptions to this rule. So the short answer is that there isn't really much of a difference at all. Moths and butterflies share the same basic biology and have far more similarities than differences. And one of those similarities is of course their life cycle. The life cycle of butterflies and moths is one of nature's most amazing processes. Each species does things slightly differently but they are four clear stages to the life cycle that they all have in common. The egg, the caterpillar, the pupa or chrysalis, and finally the adult moth or butterfly. Females lay very small eggs, sometimes in clutches and sometimes on their own. The eggs are usually laid on or near a plant that the caterpillar likes to eat. In today's example, an orange tip butterfly lays her eggs singularly on cookie flower and garlic mustard plants. Each egg hatches into a caterpillar, as you can see in this picture here, which is the eating and growing stage of the life cycle. Often the eggshell is the caterpillar's first meal before it moves on to eat various types of plant material, mostly leaves, but also flowers, fruits, stems and roots, and some feed by tunneling within leaves or stems and even inside tree trunks. A caterpillar grows in stages called instars, each time splitting and shedding the old skin to allow its body to expand. Reaching full size can take 
a few weeks, up to a few years, depending on the species, and some can grow up to 27,000 times their original weight. The caterpillar then becomes a pupa with a tough outer skin inside which the incredible process of metamorphosis takes place, its body reorganised into a moth or butterfly. Many caterpillars burrow into the soil to pupate, others fasten themselves to plant stems with silk, or they make a cocoon and pupate inside it. The time spent in the pupa stage varies with the species from weeks to years. When the moth or butterfly emerges, its wings are crumpled and need to expand and dry before it can fly. The months in which each stage of the life cycle occurs differs with the species. The winter may be spent as an egg, a caterpillar, pupa or adult, either in hibernation or in some cases active. A few species of moth fly and reproduce in the winter. The timings of adult and caterpillar life cycles are often linked to their food plants. Lots of species are in the caterpillar stage during the spring, when new leaves are soft and succulent to eat. The spring abundance of caterpillars in turn affects the ecology of other wildlife that eats them, especially breeding birds. Many types of bird time their breeding so the chicks hatch while there are plenty of caterpillars to feed them. Did you know blue tit chicks eat an estimated 35 billion caterpillars a year? <laughs> Quite a lot, hey? So throughout their life cycle, butterflies and moths are a very important food source for a range of animals from small mammals and amphibians to birds and bats. And this means they need many adaptations and tricks in order to survive. Many butterflies and moths in all of their life stages have camouflage colours to help them hide. Buff tip moths, colours, markings and size make them look like a broken birch tree twig. And the Mabel de Jure moth is a perfect match for lichen covered bark. So let's see if you can spot these caterpillars, moths and butterflies. Spot the caterpillar. Well done if you managed to spot it here. How about this one? Uh, spot the butterfly. Yeah, the beautiful brimstone. How about this one? Spot the moth. Well done. So this is the Anglo Shades moth. Now, many moths and butterflies use patterns that break up their outline so that their shape is not so recognisable. The Anglo Shades, which is a common garden moth, combines several strategies. The triangle markings break up its shape into sections that are less moth shaped. At the same time, its colours are good for blending in amongst egg leaves or on bark. In addition, its wings at rest have a crumpled shape, which is similar to a dry leaf or the cracks and folds on bark. Some store chemicals from the plant to give themselves a bitter taste and use bright colours to warn predators not to eat them, such as the cinnabar moth caterpillars, which feed on ragwort and they still show those warning colours as adults. Others put predators off with hairs, which would irritate their throats or spikes that resemble stings. A few have evolved eye-like markings and flashes of colour to scare their predators. And some disguise themselves as something distasteful, such as many tartrix moths looking like bird droppings, <laughs> and the hornet moth um, here which has evolved to look just like a hornet, even having similar transparent wings without any scales. Knowing hornets sting, predators are likely to avoid it, not realising it's completely harmless. Bats are major predators of moths. They find moths in the dark for echo location by emitting high-pitched squeaks and listening for the echo. In response to this threat, many night flying moths have evolved ear-like organs, which can pick up the squeaks of the bat and allow them to take evasive action. They may escape by changing direction suddenly or even by performing aerial loops and spirals. And if the bat is very close, they may simply shut their wings and plummet earthwards. Other moths even go as far as making their own squeaking sounds to confuse the bats. So where can these beautiful tricksters be found? 
Butterflies and moths occur throughout Britain and are found in all sorts of habitats, from gardens, farmland and woodlands to coastal sand dunes and mountain tops. But the distributions are impacted by the caterpillar's food source. Some species are widely distributed, while others are limited to certain types of habitat. Some caterpillars are restricted to specific types of plant, which only grow in certain conditions. For example, the northern brown argus butterfly larvae eats common rock rose, which grows on chalk grassland cliffs and rocks, and particularly in Yorkshire, it's found amongst limestone pavement. Other species can eat a variety of plants or plants which occur in many different places. So those species are the ones that are more widespread. For instance, many species eat the leaves of native trees such as oak, birch and willow or common plants like dock, dandelion and plantain. Many adult moths and butterflies need to feed on nectar for energy. They use a long hollow proboscis to suck nectar from flowers and in the process help pollinate the flowers. Butterflies and moths are thus not only important for the feed chain but also important pollinators for many species including crops. Unfortunately butterflies and moths are in trouble and need our help. Their numbers have decreased alarmingly over recent decades. Reports found that three quarters of the UK's resident and regular migrant butterflies and two thirds of larger moths declined in abundance occurrence or both over the last 40 years. Habitat loss through intensive agriculture, changing woodland management and urbanisation is a huge factor in their decline. Though there's still much to be learned on how many other factors such as chemical and light pollution and climate change may be also impacting populations. The disappearance of these beautiful creatures is more serious than just a loss of colour in the countryside. They are highly sensitive indicators of the health of the environment and, as we have discussed today, play crucial roles in the food chain as well as being pollinators of plants. Butterflies and moths have been recognised by the government as indicators of biodiversity. Their fragility makes them quick to react to change so their struggle to survive is a real serious warning about our environment. Fortunately, there are many things that we can all do to benefit moths and butterflies. Many of the declining butterfly and moth species live in gardens and hedgerows, meaning everyone can help in their conservation. The way we all manage our gardens can make a big difference and perhaps the easiest way is simply by managing them a little less. Hooray for all those less avid gardeners. <laughs> Too much tidiness is not good for wildlife, uh, nor are concrete decking and gravel or astroturf lawns. If you have a balcony or paved garden, you can introduce some pots and you can also help by the choice of plants that you grow in your garden. And if you have any hedges, limit the amount of trimming. Cutting field hedges every few years is much better than annual flailing. Hedgerows with trees and wide grassy margins are especially good habitats. Organic farming can also be beneficial as it reduces the use of pesticides, herbicides and fertilisers and maintains more healthy and varied habitats. Buying peat free compost as well and organic produce can be a great help. Climate change is affecting moths and butterflies as well as other wildlife. You can contribute to slowing and limiting climate change by trying to reduce your carbon footprint, particularly by reducing your use of fossil fuels for heating and travel. Information on the changes in butterfly and moth populations can help conservation organisations to understand the problems and plan effective actions. Uh, you can help with this by becoming a regular moth or butterfly recorder or by reporting casual sightings. You don't have to be an expert, um, I promise. <laughs> and spread the word. Let's get the world fascinated by these incredible creatures and share your photos of discoveries with friends and family. Thank you for watching today and to all of these people who allowed me to use their images. 
and tune in to my next sessions to learn how to identify butterflies and moths that can be found in the Yorkshire Dales and the different ways that we can record them.